Welcome back to the history of graphic narratives. Today we're going to talk about parody and caricature and the way in which this influenced the way we reinvent the way we see the world. This is a very important idea in the idea of comics especially. The word comic means something funny or humorous. So something parodic, a parodic element is entered into it. We think about the great history of images. You know, the ancient Egyptians built these very serious and um, powerful, uh, austere looking uh, portraits of uh, pharaohs. But there also is alongside that history of the grand and the glorious of art, there's the parodic. Now, many of these creations are not as enduring, and many of them have been sort of filled out in the margins of art history. We find some very interesting and telling images of parody when we start to see this idea of animals acting like humans. Here we see in this papyrus of satirical vignettes, this lion and gazelle are playing this game called Senate, which is sort of like an early prototype of chess. Um, in this drawing, we see the lion and the gazelle playing a game and holding the pieces as if they're people sitting in chairs. And we also see in this uh, little drawing uh, a fox is herding goats and also there's also a cat that's herding sheep. So there's this idea of predator and prey that's a theme that's kind of coming through each of these. And in the very last panel, you can see that the lion is sort of taking advantage of the gazelle having won the game at Senate. Here is a scroll from Japan called Choju Jinbutsu Giga the scroll of frolicking animals and people. And again, we have these uh, sort of animals acting like people, these sort of elaborate scenes, these sort of parodies of Buddhist practices in Japan. We see a monkey saying a prayer to a frog Buddha. Uh, what are the meaning of these? The folktale or the popular aphorisms that are associated with this uh, scroll have disappeared. There's no writing on it explaining it. Obviously, the creator believed the images at the time were so self-evident they needed no further text. But we are sort of finding these rather beguiling images uh, throughout history and throughout time in different cultures. When humans or animals act like humans, we know that there is a sort of human parody that is happening with these kinds of actions. And so to make fun of being human, this was one of the most common characteristics. Aside from looking like an animal or animals acting like humans, we have this idea that uh, people might be shown in sort of embarrassing situations, people defecating or people uh, barfing. This is a way for people to be look ridiculous. Or in the case here, the dead are hanging by his feet. This uh, German drawing from 1438 is a very interesting little artifact. These were created with the sole purpose as uh, would be a way to insult somebody should they uh, forfeit on a debt. And so if they were in arrears in the debt, the person who held the debt, they could go into a public square and post this insulting image of the person hanging upside down with crows pecking at their feet and their family crest also hanging upside down. And this was a way to render them absurd and ridiculous. And this was sort of uh, the challenge that was intended to keep people um, from defaulting on their loans. True caricature as we know it today is a really a modern creation. And I mean modern in the sense that it is something that was invented uh, in the early, in the Renaissance with this uh, way of, of realizing the figure in, 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 other than 
as things actually appear. So whether you're making an animal act like a human, it's still recognizable as the animal. Whether you're making a person look ridiculous by doing something, hanging upside down or defecating, these are ways in which the person is still the person, identifiable as a person. But a caricature is a strange distortion. It's taking what we know to be a person and twisting and extending and loading their image or effigy. And that's what the word caricature means in Italian. It means to load or burden. Leonardo da Vinci was one of these early inventors of the caricature, a man who was an absolute master of human anatomy and proportion, who studied these things scientifically, took great pleasure in, in drawing these strange, distorted caricatures, which were sort of humorous uh, ways of talking about human folly. We see this old withered crone here on the lower left, and she has a flower in her bosom as if she were a young girl. And so this kind of image making was a fantasy, was a fiction. And it's a very interesting twist on this idea of both being one, believably realistic, and at the same time, not actually existing as such, but revealing some kind of inner truth. Caricature from the time of the Italian Renaissance starts to spread in popularity. And as this idea of the caricature grows, other important artists at the time who were masters of anatomy used caricature as a way of kind of training their students to be loose, to be flexible, to try out new ideas and expression, to keep their lines and work lively and innovative. So caricature became this kind of tool. And they were private matters. They were things that people doodled in letters or on little cards that they passed around. There was something sort of private for people in the know. It was making fun of other people who were sort of also sort of in this part of, uh, you know, the nobility or in among the church elders. And also the sort of more generic characters. So the, the Karachi brothers were the ones who were first to know to really popularize this idea of the caricature. Here you see some caricatures from 1620 in Bologna. You can see the idea of the glutton, the idea of Aravis. And then we start to see the human form sort of changing into more animal-like characteristics, not just distorting the human form, but making someone look like something less than human. So prior to this time, we had this thing where we would show people in ridiculous situations, such as the horse America throwing off his master, which is King George here being bucked off a horse. King George is made to look ridiculous, uh, like he's about to, to fall. And so it is a caricature in the sense that it is making fun of the person, but is not a true caricature, such as William Pitt by Gilray, where we see the distortion of the figure into something else. And here, uh, William Pitt is made to look like a mushroom going on a, hull, a hill of dung. So prior to about 1775, Caricature was sort of a private matter, something that people did for, them, for their little circle of friends. And yet, the, as printing expanded and people were sharing these ideas more and more, there's a, a change in the idea of self and society that happens in 1775 with the explosion of the macaroni style. This idea of individual autonomy in appearance and this idea of kind of being a celebrity by the way you look and, and the way you carry yourself. Now, a little bit of backstory here. The macaroni style was a kind of London fashion steam that came over from Italy and France. And it was these massive hairdos that people were adopting. The bigger, more flamboyant, the more outrageous, the better. These massive hairdos took hours to prepare 
And this is what people did. And they were constantly sort of inventing new hairstyles. The more outlandish, the larger, the better. And this was part of this idea of kind of being a celebrity, being kind of known for your appearance, which would be different uh, from somebody else's appearance. So while you're all making sort of big hair displays, yours would have your own personal nuance and character uh, about it. And so this shift in the idea of personhood changes at this time. And with the publication of all of these different macaroni styles, we start to see the idea of caricature in print for public consumption become fashionable. So here are some other examples of this idea of the macaroni style. This woman who has a whole battlefield uh, displayed on her head and other outrageous and extraordinary fashions of the day. Distorted to an extent, but really the fashions were quite extraordinary to begin with. James Gilray, as I said, was one of the leading artists of this new reign of caricature. He had a passion for caricature and he could make people look so outrageously foolish and so completely absurd that he was, in a sense, a, a kind of master of this distortion in the realm of caricature. And he brought to it a kind of vividness and an intensity that was not just political, you know, making someone look foolish, but a kind of intensity that makes his drawings still interesting today. Take, for example, his image of the cowpock, which was uh, 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 one of the earliest uh, attempts at inoculating people against uh, infectious diseases. And here he's making fun of the effects of this quote, cowpock. And people have cows now sprouting from various orifices and parts of their body. And he makes this so intense and so absurd that we, we get it. This is the kind of strange intensity of a James Gilray cartoon. Gilray suffered uh, a terrible malady of gout toward the end of his life. And here he did a caricature of his, a personification of his disease that afflicted his foot with its claws tearing into his flesh and his fangs ripping and flames shooting out of its nose. This is the sort of the embodiment of gout, this painful, debilitating disease that had no cure at the time. James Gilray would go and die in poverty and madness because this is, you know, the, the, the trials and tribulations of his day were quite severe. But he left behind this intensity of what was possible in caricature that completely altered the field for many years to come. Many artists uh, felt Gilray was rather uh, too direct in making fun of individual people. And so classes of people were more likely to be pilloried and made fun of. Uh, Thomas Rawlinson was a particularly favorite to make fun of barristers and lawyers and, and such uh, judges and magistrates. Rawlinson was uh, the first to really explore this idea of caricature in a rather novel way. He invented a character the sort of type of character, the schoolmaster, he called Dr. Syntax. And this sort of caricature parody of a school teacher goes on a journey um, on his way of kind of seeking a sort of uh, new inspiration for writing a book. He's immediately waylaid and robbed and his horse is stolen from him. And he goes about the rest of his, his trip in this kind of shaken and, and uh, disturbed state from that. He eventually gets his horse back and yet his tail had been cut off. And then we also see late in the, he comes upon a library and he sees his book in a dream flying among all the other books from the shelves. What's so extraordinary about this Dr. Syntax book was it was a, an invented character who was told in a series of pictures. Now, Rowlandson created the pictures, and then he went to a poet 
to kind of put words to the story. But really, he invented the pictures first. And so it's a very picture-driven story that's based on characters. It's proved so popular that Dr. Syntax was made to have several sequels. And so he's actually one of the very earliest ideas we have of an invented character who has a repeated appearance across several publications. Dr. Syntax was so popular, in fact, that he was used to sell various goods, and that he becomes one of the earliest examples we have of cartoons used for marketing. In France, one of the great masters of caricature was Henri Daumier, who could draw like an angel and brought this incredible force of artistic skill to this new technology called the lithograph. We'll talk more about the lithograph later, but in this his work, you can see this wonderful, fluid, expressive line work that he made his, his drawings look like they were happening right as you saw them. These wonderful gestures and expressions that made his people stand out and were so visible. Uh, here he's making fun of a famous photographer who literally went up in a balloon, was first to go up in a balloon with a camera. And so Daumier is making fun of him by saying he's elevated uh, photography to the height of art. Henri Daumier uh, had many really fascinating ways of working. One of them was to actually sculpt his people that he was making fun of in clay. He wasn't allowed to bring paper or pencil into the, the place where the politicians were working. So he brought in a lump of clay and he, then those models were the basis for all his caricatures. Daumier really was, uh, through a series of lawsuits, forced to move away from making fun of individual people. And like other people at the time, began to do broader caricatures and ideas in, of ordinary people or classes of people, not individuals. And again, he too would sort of segue into repeated characters that would be a part of his mainstay. You only have to look at modern art to see the profound influence of caricature on the way in which they approach the figure and the face through these expressive modeling to come at something more true than what is apparent from the eyes alone.